decided that I would give a talk about how these things are changing. Uh, I encourage you to be part of the way they change and um, to help us think about how to make them better and better and better that as evolving creatures. Those of you who were here last year remember that I have a, an odd view of evolution, which is that we're uh, version 1.0. You in the audience are version 1.0. I said that last year to the sort of shock of the audience. I think 1.0, given what goes on in the world, is generous, and, and uh, we should, um, but never mind. So, so at the end of tomorrow, I'll do a more formal thank you, and maybe we'll have a discussion about what we've done. Um, I, I, I want to, there are many, many people that made this happen. And if you were uh, paying attention to all the emails you got, um, you know that the two people who did uh, an enormous amount of work were my, whoop, my daughter, Carissa, and uh, Denise Reed. And so, um, thank you. Then, then uh, thanks. And, and you know that we have this rule um, that is meant to, to make the discussions continue in some way. And the, it's not a rule, it's a, let's call it a privilege. If you came here to speak for the rest of my life, you can come each year at our expense. And so many of the speakers and moderators have come back to be um, provocative. I hope, and, um, and some, a couple of people who are speaking this year spoke previously, that's also okay. Um, and so the idea is that this is supposed to build. There are sponsors that are listed over there and in the back of the program. Uh, the sponsors have been wonderful. Um, most, for the most part, you can't buy anything from them, so I'm just thankful for their help. Um, yeah, they're, they're just, it, it's good. And, um, and then at the bottom, besides the speak, past speakers and all of you, it says that Rick Guidotti is coming back. So you may remember him. He's the former fashion photographer who became a modern hero uh, in the world and has gone from making a million dollars a year like some fancy CEO to a guy who makes almost no money and takes pictures of people who need to hold high self-esteem in spite of whatever genetic thing they had. And he's an unbelievable person. He won't get here till later today, but tomorrow at lunch he's going to give a little talk about how citizens, you know, in his case, a, a fashion photographer turned better uh, how people can help with whatever it is we're trying to do, which we'll talk about. So, uh, so I put this together as a way, and, and like always, it, if somebody wants to interrupt, just scream out something. Don't, don't be bashful. I'll do that when you speak, so you can do that. Um, you know, so every year I do, I do commit, it's kind of, to uh, moving away from omics, the science I really like, to something better than mere omics. And I remember last year saying, and in fact I said, we're going to really do it this year, uh, whatever that means about education and action, and still continue, as you'll hear to, today and tomorrow, to do wonderful science. Bush. Um, I always show this slide. In a sense, this is about personalized medicine. And I've shown this slide only about 9,000 times in my life. The goal of personalized medicine is to move the curve of life quality from curve A to curve B. And we've had this conversation a gazillion times. And we all end up understanding that the only debate about curve B is the slope. 
at the end. Would you like that to be four minutes, four days, four weeks, or four years? That's the discussion. And we've, in a, in a kind of little mini survey, have agreed that four hours is too short to kiss your kids, and four weeks is too long for the same reason. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to say to my children, I didn't mean that. Um, so four days is the slope. And then last year, oop, last year I showed this slide because last year I was coming off a bad fall and that was bad and I showed you that. And you all felt appropriate sympathy. I, or I, I showed that slide so you wouldn't hug me because I was, I, didn't want to be hugged. It's no longer true. Oh, and this is, this is my new slide for this year. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to publicly thank Byron Hewitt, who's here. Somewhere, there he is. So you can all get to meet him. He's here and his family's here. We're making this into a family event. Um, kids are here. His wife is here. It's all good. Um, and what this really means, this ascending red line, for me, is that uh, my life has gotten to be more about science and less about actually building a business, which I'm not, I would not have been particularly good at. And so it's, uh, it's my pleasure that he's here. This is also a slide that I'm showing because I'm a narcissistic asshole. And I, it, and I want to show you this slide because it's so important. It has nothing to do with what we're talking about. <laughs> nothing, zero. But in 1989, I fell asleep with my two sons, uh, Nicholas on the left at some age, well, six, five or six, and my son Jody, who was older, the one on your right. And we were trying to figure out a gift to give to Hope for uh, Mother's Day. And Carissa, the genius that she is, actually said, I have an idea. I think we may all have said we have an idea. So we made that other picture just a week ago. And, and it, it's kind of, a, if you don't mind, I'll just leave it there for the rest of the symposium. <laughs> it has nothing to do with what we're here for. Okay. So the first year, if you remember, many of you have been here all the time, we were really heavy on omics, all omics, heavy on science. And we were, uh, we tried then and will again today and tomorrow, to ask the scientists who have jargons of their own to make sure that no one gets lost. That's the idea. Because if you remember, on the first year, we kind of had a, an idea about an informed citizenry being able to make better decisions, because that's true. I mean, you know that that's necessary. Uh, you don't know if it's sufficient. Um, in fact, much of what we're going to talk about in the next two days is actually explicitly about how it is not sufficient to change the world in any good way just because you know more when you apply your logical brain. Um, so I've spent the last years, as this thing is evolving, trying to figure out how we, we, all of us, and everybody else make decisions. And what it says is, it is not pretty, whatever that means. So we made, uh, I made, actually, this is, there's no we in this. <laughs> it's, you know, it's like there's no I in team. Everybody says there's no I in team. There's no we in this team. I just got tired of, of us not confronting what I think are, is a bigger problem. And it's the problem of how our brains work in our decision making. And, and today and tomorrow, with some help, real help from people who think about this much more deeply than I do, we are going to try to dig into that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Um, so I want us to have an educational agenda about decision making and intentions. And that's why we called this thing Head, Heart, and Healthcare. And it, I want to be clear that I have a concept, a biology concept, of what it means to have a reptilian brain, an evolution concept. Uh, and it says in partnership, 
not in opposition to, but partnership with our reptilian brain. So if you think about who we all are, and you're a, a molecular biologist who thinks because you understood the tree of life, the Carl Woes, the scent trees, you kind of think you know where we came from, and you're kind of, you think that's good, and here we are, and I'm who I am. Well, that's crap. You're not who you are. You're who everyone before you was. This is not Jungian collective consciousness or unconsciousness. It's not that. It's that everything that ever happened to you know, reptiles and bugs and everything and all that descent, it's all in your DNA. You think you only have Neanderthal DNA in you? That's stupid. It's all there. And so what does that mean? It means that you're a bag of unknown stuff. And every time you think logically, you think, ah, I'm being a human. That's good. But being a human is tough because you've got all this stuff that's kind of reptilian. This is not a discussion, this is for joy, this is not a discussion about whether I actually know where the amygdala is, a word I've never used until right now. I, I don't know where it is. I don't is that there are old parts of us that are always reacting or not. And this year, my favorite book in the GLS book club is this Daniel Kahneman book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And you're going to hear a lot about that during these two weeks. It is two days. It's an amazing book. A very good friend of mine who spoke previously and is here from Switzerland, and I kind of read the book at the same time and corresponded by email, and she's here, Grazia is her name. She talked a couple years ago. And, and it bothered her, because she's a real scientist, uh, it bothered her that the Kahneman book, he's a psychologist, and he won a Nobel Prize in economics for this book. Um, so this book does not actually worry too much about the amygdala. It doesn't care either, because it's all a black box view of the way humans behave. And I, I think it's really important. And I consider it to be a companion piece to an older book, older by a mere 20 years, which is a book that no one will read again, but you all should. This book by Robert Wright, The Moral Animal, a book that people hated when it came out. Hated it because it was a book, a journalist, Robert Wright is a journalist, and he went off and studied sociobiology for a couple of years and wrote a book. And that's what The Moral Animal is about. It's about the E.O. Wilson 1975 big thick volume of sociobiology. And people hated the book because it seemed to defend your hardwired awfulness. Rape was considered to be fended. Uh, in the last chapter of The Moral Animal, Robert Wright actually gets to his thesis, which is, yes, we're hardwired. E.O. Wilson was a genius, uh, is a genius, he's still alive. Um, I just learned the other day he's from Alabama. Uh, that's important. And, um, and he's a genius. And um, in the last chapter of Robert Wright's book, he actually makes the argument that because we are prescient creatures, we can think logically and beat, it was actually his concept, that you can beat your reptilian brain. So that's a pretty important idea. I think it's wrong. I think that, uh, that, that it's, but it's important. And what's really, I think, more likely to be true is that at best we can deal with our hardwired and our, our more logical self as Kahneman do it. It's the fast thinking, reactive thinking, which is the logical part. Um, speak better. Um, so the idea is that there are 500 people that signed up for this thing. There are probably 400 of you that are sitting here in the room. Uh, some people will show up as soon as I'm done. And, um, <laughs> and then we have all these speakers that have been uh, coming and thinking about this. 
So what are we going to do? So we can keep having dinners and parties and, and get all smug about how great we all are, or we could actually try to do something. So my vote is that we try to do something, whatever that is, as an evolving something. And this is then the introduction to the rampant use of Scott Danielson and Bob Duke, and I need to say a little bit about them. So those of you who have been coming know that Scott Danielson has spent a lot of time as an advertising guy. He used to be a filmmaker. He's, he used to work for, for United Healthcare. He thinks about healthcare. And he's a really, really good guy. And uh, you heard his talk, I think, in the first year, and you all thought, wow, because he was working on trying to help women in Africa uh, only have protected sex instead of unprotected sex. And those of you who heard that talk were ecstatic that somebody would do that, and he did. And, and then Robert Duke, you all remember, because he's a music teacher, not a, he's not a scientist, he's a music teacher. And, um, and they become friends here, and, and for those of you who ever look at the videos of these things, you will recall that the video of Robert Duke still will bring tears to your eyes because of this child playing the cello. And when that person plays the cello, you cry because it's so unbelievably beautiful. And, and so he's a teacher, he's a music teacher. He also had one of the funniest figures in his talk that anyone ever showed, which was retain knowledge as a function of time during a semester with a sharp peak and equally sharp decline timed just before the midterm and the final. <laughs> and when they showed that graph, everybody said, oh my god, because it's of course right. So why are they, why do they figure here the way they do? This is a setup for them to get incredibly nervous about the next two days. They called me, they've been talking to each other, and they called after some time, some few months ago. And I think the first thing they said is, we would like to hijack the meeting. Uh, incredible first sentence. And I thought my answer was equally bold. I said, great, is what I remember. If, Bob, you can, Scott, I don't know where you're sitting, but, but um, that's what I think. And so we talked about it. And so when you look in the agenda, you'll, you'll read their lovely abstract and still be quite unclear what they're doing. And you'll notice that <clears throat> etudes, uh, five of them during the course of the day. And, um, and then they will wrap up um, on Saturday before we say thank you and listen to whatever anyone else wants to say. So it's an idea to kind of move us down that path. So I want to say just a little bit more and then be done because they're supposed to go on in five minutes. Um, Everyone is not on the same page about this stuff. So those of you who like to read politics must be aware that there's a program being pushed by a House of Representative member from Texas, whose name is on the next slide, and it's called the First Act. How could you be against the First Act? I mean, yes. And it stands for something good, frontiers in innovation, research, science, and technology. How could you be against that? Yay for that. These guys are creeps, is what I'd like to say. This is all being recorded. This is not good. And the reason it's not good is there's a complete misunderstanding of how technology gets developed and how it's implemented into our lives. And that misunderstanding is so strong and basic that I thought I would go on and on about that. So here's his name, Lamar Smith. Doesn't matter, you can't read all that, the, the font is tiny. You can go look it up on, the, on the, your, your present source of all knowledge, the web. And, um, and, it, and basically what this is is a, an attempt to wreck the NSF. That's what it is. It's an NSF wrecking bill. Nice. What's wrong with the NSF? Answer, nothing. They give money to people to figure stuff out so we can do something with it. That's called research. So this is 
just nauseating is what I'd like to say. I'd like not to tell you what I really think. It's nauseating. And you know, you can't invent anything according to schedule. And I have examples of these things that you hear. Here's an invention, an invention that led to a lot of value, a drug, it leads to, led to the stuff that we now do at Somalogic. And the questions in red, really, the first question, would the US taxpayers have told the architects of the first act, to give Larry Gold and Craig Turk money to futz around with a T4 Gene 43 translational operator? What? <laughs> Come on. I mean, the number of you in this room who understood what I just said is 5%, OK? And, and nobody would have done that. Why did we do that? We did it because it was interesting. So that's the idea. Interesting stuff leads to innovation, I think. You might say something like that. I don't know what you're going to say yet, but you get, you get the last word. And so these things are slow. And it says in the bottom that biology is tough. It's mysterious. It's mysterious because of your evolutionary and um, experiential lives. You are the integrated sum of all of it starting a long time ago, not just at the moment when the last non-human primate became our line of descent. That is not the way evolution worked. There were things before monkeys, and those fragments of DNA are floating around in your bodies. So give it up if you think it's going to be easy. I want to show you one more thing, and then I'll turn this over to uh, the the, to, to, to Matt, who's going to be our moderator. I went to a wonderful lecture on Tuesday, a symposium, actually. Tad is here. And a person who works in his lab showed these slides, and he gave them to me to show you, because they're kind of remarkable. So here was the title of a paper. And isn't that just beautiful? Come, come on. It, it, the, the, it's not that. I'm against directed engineering approaches when you know enough. I'm not against that. I'm part of a biotech company that has to make products. I understand that. And, but in the earliest stages, thinking in a way that is kind of stupid is critical. And this paper, which is beautiful, and which Tad had sent around, did send around six years ago, has all these wonderful sentences. You could have gone and grabbed lots of sentences about, uh, about how important it is to drive toward answering questions without knowing too much about the value. When Craig Turk did his experiment, it wasn't until the experiment was done that we filled the whiteboard up with all the possibilities that came from that experiment. But before that, we didn't fill any whiteboards. We didn't have any ideas. The experiment drove us to an idea. And I think that that's a really, really important thing. So I want, this is my last slide, and then you're on. Um, so what we want these things to evolve into is more and more science and more and more thinking about how you scale better behavior beyond your logical brain in the kind of language of Kahneman, I think. Uh, it even says here, let's get healthcare practitioners aligned. And then it says politicians. We're at lunch today. Senator Michael Bennett is going to talk a little bit. It's really going to be fun. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, he's a good guy. So there are good politicians and there are less good politicians. But the key is that they are um, politicians. And so. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing else to say except it's our job to help them do better than they do these days, not aimed at Michael in any way.